Mabuhay! Welcome to a new episode in our Global Voices Insights series of virtual conversations. Our topic, Milk Tea Alliance, Thailand, Taiwan, and Hong Kong's unified fight for democracy. I am Mong Palatino, the Southeast Asia editor of Global Voices. I'd like to greet everyone who's watching the live stream on YouTube, Facebook Live, and Twitch. Greetings also to those who will be watching the recording later. We will discuss the Milk Tea Alliance and the impact of this transnational youth protest movement in East Asia and beyond with experts from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Thailand, as well as with other members of the Global Voices community. We hope to answer these questions. Why the name Milk Tea Alliance? How did it start? What is it actually? How did it spread across the region? Why are Chinese trolls targeting it? And what are its prospects this year? To help us answer these questions, we invited panelists from independent media outlets, partners, and friends of Global Voices. From Thailand, we will have Anna Nawatana Trakul, English language assistant editor for Prachatai, a Bangkok-based online news- newspaper focusing on human rights, which has been covering the 2020 pro-democracy protest in Thailand. Next, we will have Oi Wan Lam, Global Voices Regional Editor for North- Northeast Asia. Oi Wan is a media activist based in Hong Kong, where she has founded a number of citizen media initiatives, including InMediaHK.net and factcheck. FactCheckLab.org. She also teaches a course on new media and society under the Global Communications Program in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. From Taiwan, we will have Brian Yu, one of the founding editors of New Bloom magazine. He was the Democracy and Human Rights Service Fellow at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy from 2017 to 2018. Finally, we will have Darika Bamrung Chok, Digital Rights Manager at Engage Media, based in Bangkok. She oversees and leads digital rights and digital safety initiatives in Thailand and the Mekong region. So for our instructions to our viewers during the webinar, you can post questions to our panelists wherever you are watching. You will be able to see these questions and comments from YouTube, Facebook Live, and Twitch. So let's start brewing the discussion about the Milk Tea Alliance. So let's welcome our first speaker from Thailand, Anna. You have the floor. Hello, um, I'm Anna, and I'm going to be talking about the Milky Alliance and how it started, and also how it, um, how it, um, the way it manifests in the doing the pro democracy protest in 2020. Um, I'm, I'm going to put a, a slide up. Uh, okay. Um, so lo- let's let's start with how the Multi Alliance began. Um, it 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 sort of start with what what I would call um, kind of an internet flame war. Um, so in in April of twenty twenty, there's an actor called Wachira with Chiwari, and he was a Thai. He's a Thai actor who who was um, he was staring in a boys love series, and he had quite a lot of Chinese fans. And he retweeted a tweet that happens to refer to Hong Kong as a country. So his Chinese fans got really angry, and at one point he had to apologize to them. But then the there is a group of Chinese fans that went went through his girlfriend's Instagram and found this photo where she was replying to a friend's comment saying that she was kind of like saying that she's dressing like a Taiwanese girl. And there was also a comment on 
the same picture where what she are with told his girlfriend that she looks like a Chinese girl and she kind of said what in in sort of like actually sort of in a cute way but it got misinterpreted by um, what she was group of Chinese friends that at, at like into sounding like she was angry at being told she looks like a Chinese girl and so then then this this whole thing kind of spiral into an argument between Thai Twitter users and Chinese users and some internet trolls and bots and then um, users from Hong Kong and Taiwan also started to join in and it, it was kind of a storm of memes and back and forth arguments in which at one point that there are some Chinese people who started attacking the Thai government because they somehow think that um, Thai people would be offended by that. But at that point um, in April, it was, it was kind of a point where young Thai people have already started to protest against the government, say, so they were kind of trolling a little bit and then by a kind of agreeing with the comments and spin the criticism back at the Chinese users and then you get users from Hong Kong and Taiwan users joining in. Um, I'm going to try to mostly talk about Thailand because I think um, our panelists from Hong Kong and Taiwan will be able to talk about what's going on in their parts better than I can. Um, I want I I want to talk about how um, mostly the multi alliance in Thailand is an online solidarity movement because it happens at the same time as the pro democracy protests that took up most of twenty twenty and it. From, from the Thai point of view, it is mostly about people using social media platforms to raise awareness about issues in each other's countries and showing support for the movement that's happening in each of the three countries. Um, so I'm showing, showing some of the tweets from um, people from Taiwan and people from Hong Kong, uh, as well as uh, activist Joshua Wong, who have been um, expressing support for the Thai protesters and were calling attention to the police crackdowns on the protests in October and November of last year. And they were making arts and trending hashtags and sharing infographics and photos and, and trying to call attention to, at that time, what was happening in Thailand at a point when the state authorities have just used water cannon trucks and tear gas against unarmed protesters and arrested several of the leaders and so because there is because this happened when Joshua Wong was detained um so when when he was detained in November the Thai the Thai Twitter users um, kind of returned the favor. So they were trending the Stand with Joshua Wong hashtags and they were making arts and they were sharing information and they, they were trying to get as many people as, as possible to know what was happening in Hong Kong. And same goes with the case of the 12 Hong Kong young people who were arrested um, kind of, um, in the latter, late, kind of late last year. Um, so you can see that what started out with memes and shit posting and internet trolling um, has become a way of rallying people to stand with each other at the time at a time when Thailand, Taiwan, and Hong Kong are going through this this political struggle and this demand for democratic reforms. 
Um, Anna, do you want to sh share your screen? I I am sharing my screen. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I I realize that that people weren't seeing um the slide. So I'm going to go back back up a bit. Yeah. So and so I'm gonna quickly summarize the points. Because yeah, yeah. I'm just showing to the next speaker. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just showing how how people on Twitter were kind of um, raising awareness about what's going on in in each of the countries. So I have screen cap some tweets that are people from Hong Kong talking about the protests in Thailand and then Thai protesters talking about Joshua Wong's arrest and the other activists who were arrested in Hong Kong. Um, I'm just going to proceed to how it actually, um, what the, manif the manifestation of the multi-alliance that I've seen covering the pro-democracy protests. So this, this picture is from um, a protest in September when people were gathering in Old Town, Bangkok, kind of next to the Grand Palace. And so you can see that in this picture, they were also waving the, the flag for the movements in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, kind of in the center of the picture. And this is also from another protest in November, where you could also see that they were flying these flags and there are signs saying anti-One China and multi alliance just kind of everywhere in these protests. Um, and but it's but also um, I want to I want to show you um, this is actually from one of the police crackdowns in October, and I'm I'm showing this picture because I want to show you how Thai protesters have actually learned from Hong Kong, because before before the 16 October protest, there were infographics that were being made and shared on social media with with information on how you could protect yourselves when you go to protest, and it's very clearly taken from advice from Hong Kong protesters. Um, this is also, this is another protest on the next day. So you can see that they are using umbrellas as shields and they are wearing hot hats and goggles, um, as well as the, um, the one on 18 of October. And I'm just showing this, this picture. Um, this is from a march to a government house. So you could actually see how the protesters are dressing and um, the protective gears that they have on. Um, so just to conclude a little bit, I think it's because we are kind of going through a situation where we don't have very big protests so, so often anymore. So I feel like it remains to be seen how the multi-alliance is going to develop in, in the future. Um, and I'm just going to hand off to our next speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for mentioning that the multi-alliance is an online solidarity movement. And it emerged uh, to raise awareness about several issues in Thailand because it coincided with the rise of the pro-democracy movement in Thailand. And my observation from here in Manila, it's, it emerged in the, in, at the intersection of popular culture because you mentioned about the Thai actor, digital rights, and geopolitics. So that's interesting from the point of view of uh, someone who is monitoring the situation in Thailand. Anyway, before our next speaker, I'd like to mention that we have viewers from Timor-Leste, Belarus, Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. So greetings to all our viewers. Uh, you can watch us uh, live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. So from Thailand, we'll proceed to the next flavor of the Milk Tea Alliance webinar. This one uh, from Hong Kong, our very own uh, Oi Wan Lam from Global Voices. Okay. Oi Wan, you have the floor. Yeah. So I would like to talk about the context of the multi-alliance with reference to the rise of uh, China's random nationalism. Uh, this is a term which has been used by academics to describe the organization and emotional structure of the new generation of Chinese online patriots. Um, 
And the next one, my, can you, okay. So let's take a uh, look at who are the Chinese online patriots and the driving force behind their action. So according to researchers, uh, research is done by both overseas uh, scholars like uh, Liu Haihong in that book, as well as mainland Chinese uh, official uh, media outlet. Majority of those who have joined the online expedition to overseas social media were born after 1990s, and they are active members of online community, in particular online fans club of either popular star or subculture, like Japanese uh, boy love comic. Um, this generation is brought up in post Tiananmen era, when patriot education was adopted as a means to maintain political stability in China. The pedagogy stresses the pain and suffering that China has gone through since Qing Dynasty and places China in an antagonistic relation with other countries. Uh, one most well-known example that represents uh, China's state-directed uh, nationalistic narrative in this period is the book, China Can Say No, so you can see in the screen. It's written by a uh, leftist nationalist, uh, Song Qiang, among others. The book expresses an aspiration of a strong China that can counter the U.S. hegemony. So in the uh, book cover, you can see that the U.S. is portrayed as a global uh, police who set international rules. Uh, but at the same time, the book post uh, 1990s is also China's first internet generation. They have been exposed to a diverse popular culture like Japanese comic, American and Korean drama, online game, Cantonese pop, and etc. Uh, actually, between 2002 and 4, I was taking my uh, MP in, uh, uh, in sociology in Beijing. During that time, I worked as a research assistant on a research on China online fan club. One of the research focus was on how popular singers perform uh, patriotism on uh, stage and how their fans react to their performance. So I joined Taiwanese singer Jay Chow's Fans Club in Beijing and attend many of their activities uh, for two years. At that time, there were already signs that China, Chinese fans' love for their idols will intertwine with a uh, uh, patriotic uh, expression. For example, the fans will go crazy when the singer from Taiwan or Hong Kong express that they share the same root or bloodline with their fans. But at the same time, artists' uh, uh, patri patriotic uh, performance was more uh, a market strategy at that time. Uh, things have changed after 10 years. Under the new leadership of uh, Xi Jinping, ideological structure has become the top priority for maintaining political stability. So in uh, 2013, China introduced seven red lines for independent internet celebrities, demanding them to promote positive energy online. On the same year, Beijing launched the rumor law to su suppress online information laws. By now, Chinese social media is flooded with a positive narrative about China and negative narrative about other countries. Um, Beijing also has uh, strengthened its censorship on TV and movie. Majority of the dramas have to include uh, patriotic uh, elements in order to get an approval from the censor. A typical example of uh, such kind of patriotic movie is uh, Wolf Warrior. It's punchline, whoever offended China will be eliminated no matter how far they are. Uh, this has become a punchline for online uh, uh, patriots as well. In 2016, stay and Party affiliated media outlets were forced to pledge their loyalty to the party. And in many cases, party officials have taken control over the newsroom. 
Around the same time, singers and artists from Hong Kong and Taiwan were also forced to perform patriotism on social media if they want to enter the China market. For example, they have to help spreading uh, state propaganda such as uh, Chinese position in the territorial dispute in the South China Sea. The Communist uh, Youth League has started actively appropriate elements of popular culture in promoting uh, patriotism. In 2017, the League opened its official account on Bilibili, a very popular video platform among youth. From its official account banner, you can see that Japanese style comic has become a crucial element in youth league's image. Um, by 2018, a uh, majority of the internet corporate has established established party branch. Uh, against such background, the Chinese uh, uh, patriot fans organized their first expedition to Facebook in 2016 after Tsai Ing wen won the Taiwan presidential election. Uh, the expedition was organized by an online football fans community, originally based in a forum called Diba. Members of the community was originally referred to as Diao Si, meaning pathetic loser. Before uh, 2016, the community of Diao Si enjoyed picking fights with other online football fans community inside China, and they always won. Their punchline is uh, Diba will always wrap out their enemies in their expedition. So after 2016, the title of Diba's member has shifted from the uh, vulgar term Diao Si to Tiny Pain. It means, it, it, it means online pages. In the name of Diba, the Tiny Pains have organized uh, expeditions to Sweden Embassy's Facebook in 2018 and to pick fight with the Hong Kong protester in 2019. So it's not the first time that they have uh, uh, such expedition. They always have, have that. So in addition to expedition, the tiny things also like attacking celebrities' political incorrect acts. There are countless incidents, and the most famous one took place in 2016. A 16-year-old uh, Taiwanese singer, Zhou Zhiyu, was forced to apologize for carrying a Taiwanese flag in TV show broadcast in Taiwan. And more recently, a uh, prominent Chinese writer, Fan Fang, was labeled as traitor uh, for her Wuhan diary about COVID-19 outbreak last year. So one uh, character of uh, fans culture, the Chinese fan culture, is that they love to pick fights with their idol's competitors. Their love for their idols will turn into hatred of either their idol's competitor or their idol's lover, as they will obstruct their fantasy about the idol. So in, in addition, the fans also have strong ex expectations that their idols would perform for them. So um, uh, as patriotism has become the dominant ideology in China, the Chinese fans love and hate for their idols have a stronger tendency to articulate through nationalistic expression, and they would also expect their idol to perform patriotism. That's why when their idol were being attacked for deviating from official narrative, very often they would be demanded to uh, perform a apology, public apology. Uh, the expectation to Twitter and Instagram targeting Bryce uh, lover, girlfriend, is triggered by the fans' love for the Thai actor. So um, I, I think just now our, our speaker had already summed up uh, what's happened. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about this girlfriend. They take up the information about Bright and then find out that she had a super pretty girlfriend and they become so envious. But when they, uh, they have to find excuse to bully the, this girl, and then they find the excuse by, uh, through nationalistic expression. Um, so this is uh, something uh, uh, new 
uh, or, or something uh, something special about Chinese uh, and, uh, online nationalism. So they decide to teach the guy, Thai girl uh, one China uh, history lesson by using the tech Navy, uh, which is the account of that girl. Uh, but at the same time, some uh, parties, authorities, such as the Communist Youth League, have also approached uh, appropriate such sentiment and turn China and try to turn China into the nepotism's idols so that they would see China's competitor or whoever ruined China's image as enemy. So however, such strategy is a double-edged uh, sword. So, because uh, if their idol does not perform according to its image, the fans will be disappointed. Uh, in the past few years, whenever the Chinese government showed weakness in its uh, diplomatic relation with the U.S., the tiny things would be disappointed uh, and complain about it. So to a certain extent, the performance of China's wolf uh, warrior diplomacy is also driven by the unintended consequent of the state-led uh, fandom nationalism project. So this is uh, uh, the social media course fire between the Thai and the uh, uh, Chinese uh, nativism. Um, I'll skip this because... Um, the co cross by Hong Kong protests uh, attention very soon. So. As Hong Kong protests has, has uh, established a global information uh, network during the 2019 protests, after young activists such as Zhou He Leung tweet about the incident, many anatomists from Hong Kong and Taiwan join in the hashtag war, hashtag and uh, lemon fight. But because of the crackdown on activists in Hong Kong, now the information network is a kind of disrupt. So a uh, message about the new, uh, new tier alliance is, is not as uh, visible as before. Um, now the uh, hashtag uh, new tier alliance is mainly used for uh, sharing protest news in Southeast Asia and uh, critical comments on China. So. Uh, I don't know if uh, other countries like Thai or Taiwan or overseas uh, Hong Kong will continue to develop the hashtag in the future or not. Yeah, but for me, uh, this is a very distinctive experience because it's the first time that uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, the countries are actually look at each other and learn from each other and try to build alliance rather than just a very simple, uh, because in the past, the, the dilemmas is more about the West and the East, but this is the first time that within the region, we have something, uh, we have something like a common project among uh, the civil society. So I'll, I'll stop here and then yeah, get it to the next. Thank, thank you, Oiwan. So that is 12 minutes crash course on fandom nationalism. <laughs> Patriotic education and the ideological struggles waged by the CCP and its impact on the Milk Tea Alliance and the situation in Hong Kong. So for our viewers, uh, we, are, we are thankful for your participation. We have uh, viewers from Australia, Scotland, Uganda, and Italy, and also, of course, from other countries. Please continue to post questions and we will raise them during the open forum. So from uh, Thailand and Hong, Hong Kong, we now proceed to Taiwan. Uh, what is the impact of the Milk Tea Alliance or how do netizens in Taiwan react to the Milk Tea Alliance? So from Taiwan, we'll have Brian. Thanks Hello, for the Brian. insightful comments. Um, so I kind of want to actually pick up on this, right? How this is such an interesting phenomenon because it is a connection between Taiwan and Thailand and Hong Kong. And so I think, uh, for example, historically, one has seen a lot of solidarity between Taiwan and Hong Kong because of the shared issue uh, regarding China. And so then, for example, in the last year of protests, you had these massive rallies taking place uh, in Taiwan, for example, tens of thousands of people, up to 100,000 protesting in support of protesting in Hong Kong. Um, I think also what is shared between Taiwan and Hong Kong evidently is just, uh, just language, for example, that 
uh, one can actually just read the internet discourse in uh, in Hong Kong if you're Taiwanese, for example, just because it's, or at least understand it to a great extent because it's also written in Chinese, though no Cantonese. Um, so I think that what is interesting is the Milk Tea Alliance is as a transnational phenomenon can be seen as a stand in the region against authoritarianism. Um, it does concern itself with the China issue because it was provoked by these kind of these responses by Chinese netizens. And I think that there's this kind of growing observation that there have been uh, increased, you know, I think Chinese nationalism uh, online is increasingly visible in spaces such as Twitter or whatever on different social media networks, even in, in on social media networks that are actually banned within China. And as kind of what I mentioned, for example, there have been past incidents in which, for example, Chinese internet forum users on Diba, Chinese forum, uh, would, for example, jump the Great Firewall of China to, for example, go and attack Taiwanese pro-democracy politicians, um, such as the president of uh, Taiwan, for example, leaving all these kind of hateful comments on her Facebook page, um, coming after people and trying to dox them and that sort of thing. And I think that it is very reflective of how uh, online spaces now are spaces of political tension in today. And I think uh, it's also just interesting in that sense, the way in which uh, a lot of the Milky Alliance has taken shape is through these kind of different internet memes, uh, through cultural references to this kind of shared culture that many young people on the internet are aware of and share. And the fact that even just the name itself, Milk Tea, the fact that Taiwan, Thailand, and Hong Kong have, have shared habits of drinking some form of milk tea, it's also, that is also a sign of, let's say, globalization, just because of the fact that different food is available in different places and people are f familiar with different cuisines. In Taiwan, you know, we do have Thai restaurants and you have Hong Kong restaurants and that sort of thing. So that allows for the conditions for this to take place. And I think that then... Uh, what one sees in confronting, I think, Chinese nationalism is this sort of stand of, I think, uh, cosmopolitan democratic values versus uh, regional authoritarianism or just nationalism. And I think that is what is so refreshing about that, because online spaces, particularly, I think, in the past few years that we see with the right rise of a uh, right wing populism in, in different contexts around the world, a lot of it is just filled with this kind of nationalism. And so I think this is it is a very positive sign seeing this development regionally. But the question then I have is, uh, that I think it's, it's also worth discussing, is just then, um, how does this translate to just beyond solidarity, A? How does this can actually translate, for example, to assistance between these places for each other? And second, how does it actually involve, for example, uh, getting to know more about these struggles and learning from each other? Um, for example, in Taiwan, I think a lot of the uh, framing of the milk tea narrative is that, oh, people in the region are becoming aware of this threat of China that Taiwan has historically faced, uh, because Taiwan faces the threat of invasion from China, which would stuff out Taiwan's democratic freedoms. Um, but then, you know, when you look at, for example, protests in Thailand, that is not directly about the China issue. This is a stand against uh, the military regime there, against the monarchy and so forth by young people. And this is very similar to these different movements one has seen in the past years in, in Taiwan with the Sun Fiber in 2014, or in Hong Kong in 2014 with the, the umbrella movement and the uh, later on the anti elab movement in the past year. Um, and I think that then the commonality then is that I think particularly a lot of the Milk Tea Alliance, uh, the origin that can be traced back to this regional interest in Hong Kong, because as this massive uprising uh, among just the uh, you know, largest proportion of the population in modern history participating in protests and having these kind of innovative tactics against the riot police. And so I think then, you know, protesters in Thailand and Taiwan and elsewhere will look at this and see, you know, want to know how to learn from it, how to actually kind of attract global attention. Also, just in terms of, again, concrete tactics with dealing with the police and riot gear and rubber bullets and tear gas and so those sorts of things. And so that is, I think, where a lot of the, the interest in this kind of phenomenon comes from. But the question I often have, particularly from Taiwan, is how aware are people in Taiwan of, let's say, protests in Thailand, what they are about? I think there's still this kind of greater concern with, uh, for example, Hong Kong, and not just kind of situating this in the, in the framework of a kind of shared struggle of, for democracy that doesn't necessarily just, just have to do with the China threat, uh, the, the regional threat to democracies from China which is part of it, but also not exclusively it. And so I think, you know, for example, in Taiwan, by contrast, um, the solidarity rallies that have taken place for Thailand have been much smaller, for example, um, a few hundred people or even a few dozen people. Uh, the activists that are at organizing here are sometimes, oftentimes Thai students studying in Taiwan. And you do see, for example, um, you know, former Sun Parliament leader Chen wei for example, did go to some solidarity protests. Uh, the New Power Party, which is a third party formed after the Sun Parliament in 2014, uh, was also present at these protests, uh, pointing to that there's a need in the region to stand up for democracy. Um, but then beyond that, I just, it's also telling to me that I think that it doesn't attract this kind of attention from the Taiwanese public writ large. And so I think that that maybe is points to where there are some limitations to, I think, the, the transnational framing of it. I think that that's something that uh, people could have to learn from. Um, but I think what's also interesting then is to point to the transnationalism of activists, the solidarity of activists versus responses from the state. Um, I think now we're particularly 
uh, we are seeing these the rise of, of uh, protests, which are often youth led. Uh, you know, you're dealing with similar threats. Uh, so you're wearing you know masks, for example, to hide your identity because of the threat of digital surveillance identification. Uh, I think also just because of uh, that modern placing technology involves tear gas and batons and so forth. You have the adoption of rubber hel the safety helmets um, and that sort of thing. Um, and just so, you know, people looking at each other, looking at these images are learning from each other. And I think that uh, particularly Thailand, for example, just uh, people will share these viral images of, for example, bringing, uh, what is it, like the, the unicorn floats to the front of the protest to, to, as, a, as a barrier, as a very innovative way of getting attention, but also having a practical means. And I, I expect to see this pop up in other places, actually, in the future. Uh, for example, Hong Kong, once, let's say, COVID blows over, hopefully, and possibly protests would resume, or just other contexts, too, because, you know, movements do learn from each other in this way. Um, but then what will happen, I think, from state actors is that they will point to this shared phenomenon and claim that this is a sign of, let's say, a color revolution, that this is all stirred up by foreign forces from abroad, uh, that, 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 for example, uh, in Thailand, you might claim that Hong Kong and Taiwan are intervening there to cause this to happen, or in Taiwan, you know, or in Hong Kong, you'll have to claim that Taiwan or Thailand is involved in stirring up protests. You'll have this attempt by state actors, authoritarian state actors, to blame this on outside forces, pointing to these convergent phenomenon, or how social movements are learning from each other through phenomena such as the, the, the Milk Tea Alliance, and claiming that this, this is not coincidence. I mean, obviously it is not coincidence. It's actually that social movements are learning from each other, that activists are looking to each other, um, but then this would be used as a means of delegitimizing the movement. And I think that it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because there was a story recently in, in Taiwan in which three men, uh, three Taiwanese men were arrested for circulating Chinese disinformation. Uh, so they went to China, conducted, tra were, were trained in spreading disinformation, uh, came back to Taiwan. Uh, they were working as administrators on Diba, the internet forum that came up a few times. Um, and they tried to circulate disinformation about COVID, uh, claiming that Tsai, the president, won through election fraud, but significantly also claiming that Taiwan was involved in stirring up the Milk Tea Alliance. Uh, they had false documentation that was a letter purporting being to be between uh, uh, Taiwanese and American government officials saying that we're gonna work together to create this milk tea phenomenon online, uh, this kind of false correspondence. And so they were working on behalf of China. This is an attempt to kind of delegitimize the milk tea alliance to claim that is outside forces. And so that's one example of, of this kind of thing. I think that probably we will see more of these kind of disinformation efforts uh, in, in the new future as well, just coming up. Uh, but I think that's, that's interesting then because that points to the challenge of, of facing the milk tea alliance, the solidarity can be used against us by state actors in that sense. And I think that there will be people that do believe that because we live in an age in which there's increasing amounts of misinformation and disinformation put up by state actors or uh, online trolls or nationalists or whoever. And there are people that will believe it. And so the question then is, is what do movements draw from each other? Oftentimes what we draw from each other is legitimacy. Um, and oftentimes we are trying to learn from each other and, and build connections, but you know that, that can also be used against us, for example. Um, you know, You do have activists, for example, coming under fire or being targeted by the regimes or conducting online calls uh, just to learn from activists or even, or even you know, events such as this. Uh, for example, there's in Singapore, there's an activist, uh, Dalvin Wham, who came under fire for just having a Skype call with, with uh, Joshua Wong um, because, you know, wanting to learn from Hong Kong and that sort of thing. And so I think that's kind of the, the paradox. Um, and I think that's, that's also maybe the, where uh, just where the Milk Tea Alliance as a phenomenon would need to consider further to actually kind of have further roots and become more substantial. Um, but I think that it's just, it's, uh, I think that maybe we can discuss this more in discussion, but I think it's, it's just very, uh, it's a, it's almost a sign of the time. I think, I think that this kind of online phenomenon for us, it's, it's very extraordinary because of the fact that it's kind of the first time we've seen this, but just, we live in an increasingly globalized world. I hope that people across the world can become, uh, invested in knowledgeable of different struggles and come together in these kind of phenomena. I mean, some things that do encourage me, for example, just, uh, there's the, the odd phenomenon of, for example, people. Uh, reacting against right-wing nationalists in the U.S. by posting memes from BTS, the Korean like boy band, and that's another kind of online phenomenon. It's very transnational, I think. Uh, just that this is this fandom, for example, um, and I think a lot just intersects with, with kind of online communities. But I think what's also the, is to be careful of is that in terms of online communities, it's not always representative of a place. Uh, for example, Twitter is not very widely used in Taiwan. Oftentimes, it is people that are more uh, aware of English, for example or want to be in touch with the internet discourse. There's rising use of Twitter because of concern about uh, Facebook's desire to enter the Chinese market. And so whenever, uh, you know, there have been periodic incidents in which Facebook will suddenly start censoring mentions of Taiwanese political topics on uh, just on Taiwanese Facebook. And that, that leads to kind of more people joining Twitter. Um, but then it's still kind of a very select group of people. And I think that's also the case in Thailand. That a lot of the users of Twitter are, for example, um, 
more liberal or more educated and that sort of thing. And so this does not always represent just kind of the vast, uh, you know, the actual kind of society. It is a kind of select group of people, oftentimes it is younger people. But I think then that, that this is, is a very promising start looking at a phenomenon such as the multi uh, alliance and just where it goes from here is, is something that I think is very worth considering as a question for those of us who are invested in democracy in the region and beyond. Um, so I'll leave that there and I'll be looking forward to uh, talking later. Uh, thank you, Brian. That's a lot to unpack, but uh, you know, you discuss a lot of uh, interesting uh, topics, especially the impact of, you know, the shared culture of young people learning from each other, and also the challenges and risks that they face as they uh, wage their campaigns and about the impact of the transnational activism of uh, activists across the region. I'm sure we'll have more about this to discuss in the, in the open forum. So from Taiwan, uh, we'll discuss the impact of the Milky Alliance, not just in these uh, communities, but also in Southeast Asia, outside of Thailand. So from the Engage Media Network, and Engage Media has one very interesting project called Coconet. I think uh, Darika will be able to discuss how netizens across Southeast Asia are viewing the Milky Alliance. So Darika, you have the floor. Okay, um, thank you for having me here. So after our speakings, like, I mean, speakers already discussed what happening in Thailand, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, and then they, how they are like supporting each other under like a multi alliance. And although this network started off is quite small, I mean, of the group of the net citizen defending like a Thai celebrity as our speaker and now already mentioned. And then the hashtag has gone into a much bigger political movement. So I would like to discuss its impacts of Thai national like youth movement in other Southeast Asia country. And then how they got like um, the inspirations from the Thai protesters. And then how like the way that the protester is very creative. And then they use a lot of tactic. And then what like other Southeast Asia is already um, have um, some reflection on that. Because like um, what we have seen, I think they use a lot of interesting hashtag that like other speakers is already mentioned, tweet, memes, online posts using like popular cultures as their digital activism. But thing is like it's, it's very interesting because like many times when we have heard um, digital activism, many times it just stay online. Like echo chamber is not create any the offline um actions or activism but what we have seen the the young activists um connect to the multi alliance like thailand and taiwan and hong kong how they can translate and move the digital activism into the um the state protest that is a one example that um i mean for me i think it's quite a rare moments of the regional solidarity that happened and what we have seen a simple hashtag, but it has gone to a much bigger uh, movement as connected like minded activists in Asia. So besides Thailand, Hong Kong and Taiwan, a net citizen from other countries have also voiced their interest to support for the multi alliance. And one of the um, example is in the Philippines, if you can see um, my slide as well. The Philippines the multi alliance Twitter account is already created, and many Filipinos have taken the social media to express their support for network and in solidarity with Thailand. And some of them discuss the issue about like um, South China Sea conflict and targeting the the Chinese influence. And also, they also refer to the one of the popular hashtag that um mentioned on the social media during the Thai protest, which is uh, what happening in Thailand. And it has been modified by the net citizen from other countries. And also what we have seen the hashtag what happening in the Philippines began um, trending on the Twitters and they amplify existing anti-government sentiment during the Duterte government and the, um, the president just signed off I mean the anti Taylor law into effect. And the similar situation that the hashtag what happening in Indonesia is have been mentioned on the social media. 
In early October, like 10 of thousands of Indonesia took the state to the protest to the government. And a lot of discussion related to the protest in Indonesia and then how the Indonesian activists could learn from what happening in Thailand and how the Thai activists have a lot of creative tactic and also including the in Hong Kong and Taiwan as well. And at the same time, one of the um, discussions that happening in Indonesia is like how Thai youth activists can ensure that the protest it should be peaceful. I mean, like no violation. But for me, what has surprised me the most during the what happening um, during the protest in Thailand is a hashtag. If I translate in English, like if Lao politics was good, began changing soon after the Thai citizen used the hashtag in Thai, like Thakan Mueng Di, or if politics was good. This is very interesting moment how they use the hashtag to voice our political opinion. And this is a happen in the country where freedom of expression is very like limited and the political landscape, if I say, is like very difficult to speak up. And what I have seen how young activists and then the net citizen um, connected to each other on social media began with the multi alliance and make an impact on social movement in other countries, especially in Southeast Asia. And of course, some of them use the hashtag against the Chinese power in these regions. But more on that, they got the inspired by the activists from other countries like to fight for democracy and the anti-authoritarian regimes. Because if you look at the political regime in many Southeast Asia countries, actually we have shared some political sentiments and the young activists, I mean, who want to stand up and be and become a forefront of the protest, they feel this is enough. And a lot of the common word, what we have heard from the young activist movement from Thailand, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, the one word that they always mention, they want to have a better future in their home country. So I think that they, I mean, for the young generation that they use the social media to voice out their opinion and what they want their home country in a better situation. But as we know, I mean, um, protesting in the political regime is never easy, yeah? even though the digital technology can help them, but at the same time, it can be used against them too. I mean, this picture um, is a Thai protester in Chiang Mai, Thailand. They, I um, mean, he came to the protest with dressed up like a CCTV, but because a lot of the Thai protesters, and I think that relate to the other Southeast Asia activists, we already know that being a poor activist in the country like um, Thailand, I mean, the authority and the government is already have like a lot of the state surveillance and the tactics as well. And of course, that may open them up to certain threat digital surround and criminalizations. And especially for the online harassment, it has been increased a lot during the protests in Thailand. And many cases, it has been um, connected to the state link, um, social media, including the potential information operation. So in October, Twitter removed more than 900 Twitter accounts that connect to the loyal Thai army after the account was found that being engaging in the IO in Thai or information operation. But not just online, but what we have seen that in Thailand, they have been a return to prosecution for the less majest law, I mean, in Thailand to criminalize any threat to the monarchy. On top of the crackdown, the cause of the media censorship is also increasing in the country. So the posting, um, the protesting in Thailand, of course, the international solidarity and support that is very important. And one of the regional platform that uh, uh, already mentioned is a CoConnect. So the chart for connecting community and network it's a network and the platform for a digital rights movement in Asia Pacific. So during the 
hotels in Thailand, the coconut member, including um, CSO, journalists, um, artists, and the filmmakers, um, call for the international support. And we had the online discussion how we can support and in solidarity with the poll democracy protest and we share a lot of the campaigning idea but not just for the solidarity we share our learning material like um, listen learn especially um, security material from the activists in asia pacific how they can protect themselves during the protesting that uh, because i think at some point we have quite similar situation in terms of the authoritarian and then how the activists can learn from each other um, um, to protect during the protesting. I think I, I, will, I will stop for now and then we have some time to have Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Darika, uh, for giving us an overview of how netizens across Southeast Asia uh, are viewing the military alliance and the impact it made on countries like the Philippines and Laos. And also, you mentioned also what uh, Brian said earlier about the, some of the risks faced by activists and netizens who are campaigning through the Milky Alliance uh, hashtag. So uh, thank you once again to all our speakers, Anna, Oiwan, Brian, and Darika. We have several questions from our participants. Uh, here's a question from Chavalin. Do you think the multi alliance movement has a potential to go beyond online solidarity? So we have seen this movement as a symbolic movement, but not much in an actual fight against authorities. So uh, perhaps uh, Anna can first answer the question. Um, okay. Um, I think um, from what I've um, I'm, I'm from what I've seen in the recent protests. I think it's already starting to come offline a little bit in the sense that we've learned so much from each other and um, especially from Hong Kong and we are using the space of protest as a way of calling attention to issues that are happening in other countries. Um, and and I, 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 I do hope that it, it gets further than that because I think what Thailand, Hong Kong, and Taiwan share within this political struggle is that we are all fighting for democracy. So, so I, I do I do hope that that the movement that that the Milky Alliance can become something that's more more than online. But also, I would like to say that I think online is is good um, because there is safety in numbers and there's safety in visibility. And when the authorities um, commit violence against the protesters. We would like that. We, we would like that to be seen and known, and we need people to call attention to it. So, um, spreading information online and trending hashtags in this age of the internet, I think there is some good in that. Yes, thank you, Anna. Indeed, in Thailand. The Milky Alliance in 2020 was not just an online phenomenon because it saw young people mobilizing offline. And that's an offshoot of what uh, the Milky Alliance uh, campaigned during the first part of the year. Anyway, uh, for our next question, uh, so I think either Anna or Darika can answer this, but you can choose to answer the impact of the multi alliance in Thailand this year, not just, not just specifically about the king, but the prospect of the multi alliance in the pro democracy movement this year. So the question is about um, uh, if this protest will go on in Thailand and if they will overcome, how, what do you think will be the impact of the monarchy? The question is from Twitch. I understand this is a sensitive topic. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I think uh, I can, you, can, I can try. You, can, you can try to answer the, perhaps uh, the impact of the, pro, the, the, the Milky Alliance on the, the pro-democracy movement, which is unraveling now in, in Thailand, because you have here an, an active situation in Thailand. 
Yes, uh, I think this is a tough question. Even for me as the Thai people and then working on like a human rights issue in Thailand for how many years, but when I have seen for the young activists who really brave to speak up and then criticize the, um, the loyal family, and then I mean in the sense that they want to have uh, a reform. I think the thing, and then another thing is like, if I mean for the question, if the protest is going on in Thailand and how it will be changed, of course, it's not easy to change um, overnight. But I can say what I have seen like last year, 2020, the whole generation, the perception toward the loyal family, I mean, in terms of the status of the monarchy, is already changed. Also, we might not see the concrete in terms of the political uh, landscape, but in terms of the perception and awareness, I think it's already changed. Yeah, um, this is answer. And Anna, I think I think I think Darika has said it very well. Um, it, I think. Um, so the Thai protesters have this slogan. Um, which is let it end in our generation. But I think whether the issue is to do with the government or the monarchy or any other systemic issue that they are campaigning about, it is not going to change overnight. But um, the 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 way this the younger generation think and the way they see the world and how they deal with the culture is it has changed and is changing and perhaps in 10 to 15 years um you will see uh, more concrete and clearer changes and so in specifically to do with the monarchy i think the protesters are definitely hoping for a change so what they, they they are campaigning for reform but um as tarika mentioned in her presentation we have the less not law um section 112 which means that anyone who criticizes the the monarchy can potentially go to jail and a lot of activists who have spoken about monarchy reform are facing charges so this is something that is difficult to discuss and to campaign about in Thailand because there's always this threat of um, persecution. But but they they are trying. I think I think the protesters are trying, and they they are certainly hoping that things are going to change. Thank you, uh, Darika and Anna. Uh, for our next question, uh, we'll post it on screen. It's about. Okay, I think uh, Oi Wan can answer this. Uh, we are mainly aware of the issues of Hong Kong, Taiwan, Uyghur, and Tibet, but are there other worries for the CCP within the country that most people don't know? Mm, actually, the CCP worries about everything. <laughs> I mean, that's why it, it, it tried to F repress everything. I mean, even Jack Ma, the uh, billionaire behind Alibaba, he is a target of their worries. I mean, there are so many uh, people who have, been, uh, I mean, power elite in the in the past decade. It becomes, uh, yeah, the worries for uh, CCP. So the question is that uh, for how long they will be tired of there being worries of everything? <laughs> Thank you, I won. Uh, next question. Uh, I think uh, Brian can answer this. Uh, do you think it also include Philippines, Laos in the military alliance? Or Brian or Darika can answer this. Does it mean that any country can join? What's the criteria or eligibility to be in this alliance? To be precise, I think the main actors in this movement are Hong Kong and in Thailand. Yeah, I think well, this so. is an inclusive movement. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question because you know one does see uh, different you know definitions of what is included in the Milk Tea Alliance, and you do see people from other countries joining in, for example, um, just because you know personal interest or connection, family connection, or just uh, just they find out about this cause online and that sort of thing. And so I think the nice thing about the Milk Tea Alliance framing is that it can be expansive. And so I think that you know if you're concerned with democracy and these kind of shared values, um, you know it doesn't directly have to do with China either. Um, I, absolutely, I would say that. Um, I think that that people can actually be part of that, and so I think this is what's very interesting about this phenomenon. And so, you know, in the memes that one does see, uh, you know, I think uh, Taiwan, Thailand, and Hong Kong are kind of the main three. And I do also I agree that uh, Hong Kong and Thailand are actually the, the main ones here, the main actors. Uh, but I think it can expand, and that's also the nice thing about it. And so you do see this kind of flexible framing of it in, in the memes and, and production online of, of all this content as well. I think that's that that in itself, the flexibility and uh, permeability of it is, is is also very interesting as a phenomenon. Indeed, it is an alliance, but it, it doesn't really have a formal structure, you know. It's an informal network, and you mentioned about the framing. It's really flexible. And Darika mentioned how activists and netizens outside Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Thailand are using the lens of the Milky Alliance in raising their issues. Okay, so for the next question, I think we still have some questions. Uh, I think uh, Brian or Oiwan can answer this. Uh, to what extent has the online war between the, net, the netizens of the Milky Alliance and China's fandom nationalism contribute to a productive discussion and awareness about transnational regional issues? Mm, yeah. I, I think oh. uh, one, one of the main awareness is about the China model. Yeah, because uh, China, the, the character of China fandom na- nationalism is expedition to social media, like Twitter and Facebook, which is outside China. And then their targets are usually popular figures. So like in Korea, it's BTS, in Thailand, it's right. And every time they have this kind of expedition, it a kind of yeah, making uh, the people in that country aware that once you have to enter the China market, you have to uh, kind of submit to their logic, uh, which is totally unreasonable. So yeah, uh, in this sense, it it really raised the transnational uh, uh, awareness and and the alliance. I mean, apart from uh, the, the the share of value about democracy, it's actually very much about China as well. Because yeah, the the triggering point is is their performance of uh, Chinese nationalism outside of China. So yeah, and then this a kind of bringing others together. Thank you. Brian, you have something to add? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, what's very interesting is that when Chinese nationalists go and do this, it shows what the character of contemporary Chinese nationalism is, that, you know, there's this sensitivity uh, that it is very easily, these egos are very easily bruised and will react in this way. And so that does educate, I think, other uh, places, even places that are not as directly dealing with China as, say, Hong Kong or Taiwan, about that this this is something, uh, this is what the Chinese nationalism is like. And that's, again, as, as well mentioned, that's the price you pay to enter the Chinese market, this constant pattern of self-censorship. Um, I also hope, though, that it can allow for education about very country-specific issues. Um, also, in, in terms of the phenomena, I think maybe that in terms of the information sharing, um, memes are a great way to share information, but sometimes they're not very dense. I mean, you can kind of like unpack it and get to different layers. But sometimes it can be a little light. Um, but what is interesting then, I think it's point to the different shared patterns between let's say, authoritarian regimes in the, in the region. And that's, I think, something people can learn about. That, you know, at the same time, we see national security laws being passed across Asia, or that the rhetoric from different authoritarian regimes is actually very similar to each other. And I think that in itself is, is quite interesting, and I think educational for people. Thank you. For the next question, uh, I think Anna or uh, Darika can answer this. Considering, considering the COVID pandemic, do you think that the Milky Alliance has made activism more accessible to individuals despite external constraints? Will digital activism remain prominent uh, post-COVID? Um, for, for this issue, I, I have a bit of, um, maybe it's a question that we can all think about when, when you think about protests, um, which is that there are always going to be people who support the movement, who cannot join the physical protest for whatever reasons, you know, such as, People with disabilities, you know, if, if you use a wheelchair, you will not be able to access a lot of protest sites in Bangkok. Um, and 
I, I think this is something that we might want to think about when you think of protests and digital activism in that you cannot place all the values of a movement onto going out onto the street because um, I, I would say that the, the internet and social media is also a, a, a very important um, front line that, that we have to fight on. Okay, thank you. Darika, you have something to add? Um, yes, I think I agree with what um, Anna has already mentioned. And also, I think not just only what I have seen among, like, uh, especially for Hong Kong and Thai activists, not just they mobilize on the social media like Twitter, but they already have like a Telegram group that they want to talk each other, how they want to have like a strategy on the protest, both like offline and online. I think that's why it's make um, a movement, the student movement is become like bigger and bigger and also related to the COVID. I think in Thailand, the one thing is like, um, we are not locked down and that's why the government is seem is it tricky because the government is still used the uh, emergency decrees to say that it is a COVID, but at the same time, it's one to um, prevent the protest on the street as well. I think it's a uh, tricky, but of course, after COVID, I still believe that the protest is still. I mean, it's become bigger and bigger. But the COVID situation might make the uh, the people is more angry how the government handled the situation. I think uh, based on the answers of Anna and uh, Darika, that deserves another webinar, <laughs> the COVID, uh, post-COVID uh, activism. Anyway, for our last question, sorry, we, we lack the time already. We have a question from Tan. Would China invest more in their information operations, such as using more trolls and use their new service for the positive image of CCP? TV press, I think Oiwan can answer this. Mm, they always use uh, the tactics. I mean, they um, uh, to promote a, a positive Chinese image to uh, a new service. Uh, but um, sometimes their tactic uh, they use uh, within mainland China does not work uh, outside. Yeah. And then that's uh, something that uh, they they are still uh, adjusting. So like uh, uh, like using of troll, I think their troll has totally failed uh, in, in, in some way. And now um, uh, because there's so much uh, trouble, uh, uh, domestic trouble, so uh, I don't know. They they their control. Uh, inside uh, China will be, yeah, it's, it's always uh, promoting positive nar narrative on China and negative uh, narrative uh, about all other countries. So, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Oiwan. Now, there's one question which uh, was uh, posted in our chats. I think uh, this is one, this one is for Brian. Uh, do you think that the alliance should adapt? adapt a more centralized organizational model for greater tangible impact? You mentioned earlier about the flexibility of the framing of the campaign. Yeah, I think the flexibility is, is key because I think that is the strength of it, uh, that it, there, there's not a very high barrier for entry, that anyone can do this uh, online, it's so anonymous, so you don't actually have to fear retribution as much, though it's still possible to track you. Um, I also don't think it's actually possible to really adopt a more centralized model because it's so vast and widespread and so forth. Um, but I think that to have a more tangible impact, because a lot of questions I've touched on, for example, how to take an online phenomenon offline, uh, maybe one way about it is think about actions that could be taken, let's say global actions on, you know, uh, coordinated action in that sense. And it probably have to have some kind of open framing, like an event, and people do something. And so that could take the form of like a solidarity rally or uh, something of that sort. Um, you know, you do have global solidarity rallies very often for causes. Um, but I think also what's interesting to think about is how do you actually uh, pressure, I think, regimes? Um, regimes often have international interests, uh, for example, financial holding other places. So having coordinated actions that are across different countries um, can actually have a impact in that sense. And so I think that's something that's very interesting to think about. But I don't know if the, the, the milk tea phenomenon has really got to that stage of, think, of thinking it and adopting that kind of tactical consideration. Uh, I wonder what will actually kind of take to get there. 
Okay, so thank you, uh, Anna, Oiwan, Brian, Darika. Different flavors, all milk tea, different models, all for democracy. So let's all drink to democracy. To all our participants who watch our webinar, please visit the Global Voices uh, website through globalvoices.org. Read the coverage of events and topics from around the world in over 30 languages. From the site, you will be able to sign up and receive our daily and weekly newsletters. And please follow us on Twitter, at Global Voices, and also on Facebook and YouTube. Once again, this is Mong Palatino from Manila, Philippines, thanking everyone for your participation in our Global Voices Insights webinar.